Good evening and welcome to this public worship service held at St John's Presbyterian Church Annerley with our resident pastor, our Reverend Martin Duffield, leading this evening worship. Again, we commend to you those of our church family suffering pain or hardship in particular. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation just prior to the call to worship. Thank you. worship our God at the end of this uh, Lord's Day. Our call to worship comes from the 18th Psalm this evening. And uh, the first three verses, these are the words of the Psalm. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, and my strength in him I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation a stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so I shall be saved from my enemies. Well, with those words, let's now come to the praise of God, firstly in song as we sing uh, from the Psalms, this 150th Psalm, but it's number 14, O oh, Praise the Lord. Almighty God, our glorious Lord of heaven and earth, with the psalmist we must cry, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care about him? We feel so small in the face of our world, in the face of our cosmos. And yet we know that our world is small in your eyes. There is nothing that is not contained containable to you and governable by you on the movements of the, the atomic particles in the 
microscopic molecule to the movements of the galaxies in space. In all our smallness, our Father, we sense your greatness. And the word of God gloriously confirms these truths. What can we do, therefore, but worship you? What else can we do but bow low before your greatness and power and honour you as the source of all things, especially the living things of your creation? Now, Father above, we also sing your praise for the faith that you have in us, a faith that is entrusted to us regarding the created order as a Lord of it under your hand that you endowed us with not only rights but powers and wisdom and skill. What a compliment you pay us in this, and all in spite of our sins and failures, that you do this, that you have even declared, declared of mere men such as we are, that nothing will be impossible for us. And why would nothing be impossible for us when we are your image for whom nothing is impossible? We have been given rational minds and physical strength. Why would you not trust us with this work then, when by grace you gift your own people with your word and your spirit to address all the problems of the day? And how blessed is that scientist or philosopher or writer or historian or medical worker who looks to you for wisdom in the daily pursuit of this great work? And how much good have the godly done in your name in the fields of science and humanities? So for all these reasons we do rejoice this evening in being reminded of who you are, of who we are, and of what you've called and equipped us to do. So glorify yourself in our worship this evening, our God, but glorify yourself in our service in the coming week as we submit our lives and our labours to the wisdom of the word and the powers of the spirit and all to the praise of your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We are now going to hear a uh, word from the scriptures. It's Psalm 8. Psalm 8, uh, verses 1 to 9. Verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honour. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's sing again to God's praise now, 448, O Lord, who came from realms of love.
Let's hear again from the Word of God, this time from Colossians in chapter 3. The Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 25. Verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another. Even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. And again, to God be all the glory. Amen. Again, as God has been good to us in this past week, let's take a moment to reflect upon his goodness as we've already given our gifts, and then we shall come with a prayer of thanksgiving. Let's give thanks and pray. Our Father in heaven, for the strength to work in the service of others and to your glory, we thank you for their offerings this evening given during this past week. For the reward of those labours of many years through which we have been able to create wealth and continue to do so, we also praise your name and thank you. So take the offerings and gifts that have been offered, that have been deposited to the account of our congregation and use them to the greater work of the kingdom. We ask it in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now again to God's praise, 506, The Lord is rich and merciful.
Let's take a moment to pray before we come to the sermon tonight. Our God and our Father, as we come to contemplate the essential nature of what it is to be a human being, we do thank you for this knowledge which has been left for us, some of which is innate to us and which we learn also from our observations of the world. We do thank you for the revelation not only of yourself but of who we are and the grace and the dignity that that gives us. We pray now that as we hear this from Titus, the letter of Paul to Titus, that you would be pleased to teach us good things tonight. Through our Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I'm just going to read to you tonight from the letter of Paul to Titus, just the first five verses, because it will be the subject of the next uh, five verses, uh, sermons, including tonight, um, and it's verses uh, 1 to 5 in Titus, Titus chapter 2, and verses 1 to 5, let's hear God's word together. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men may be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in the faith, in love and in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behaviour, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded. Amen. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 6 it was. So we come tonight to, as I mentioned, the first of five sermons um, built around the whole matter of what it is to be a man or a woman. And tonight's sermon is under the heading, A Portrait of true humanity. The text very loosely is Titus 2.1, but as for you, speak things which are proper for sound doctrine. So let's come to the introduction. The crisis of identity is a disturbing and debilitating experience. To not know who you are or what you are supposed to be like or what you were supposed to do or how to behave is an experience of traumatic uncertainty. It is a stark and a dark and a cold wilderness of personal lostness. And sadly, it is a real problem today. It affects both genders and all stages of our life cycle. This came home to be powerfully during the prominence of the Canadian psychologist Dr. Jordan Peterson, especially in an interview I've mentioned that he did with Neil Mitchell. Melbourne radio host. Some of you may remember it. The night before the interview, after his uh, talk, Dr. Peterson was approached by at least six of the young men who were present that night who told him very honestly and earnestly that he had saved their life that night. In other words, they were suicidal. <coughs> What touched the psychologist the most, and over which he actually shed tears in the interview, was that these six suicidal young men needed so little in the way of guidance and direction to be stabilised. Guidance and direction that their grandmothers would have once given them. So what does, I, what does this say to us tonight? Well, it tells us that somewhere between the parents of the baby boomers and the millennials of today, the truth about who we are and what we are supposed to be like, what we are supposed to do and how we are supposed to behave, has mostly been lost. Men and women are growing up now with no clear idea about these things, and the effect of this is in fact deadly, as we have heard. The fact that Dr. Peterson could speak the common sense of the, their great-grandmothers and save their lives literally tells us of the massive damage that's been done to our society, our culture, in these last three generations. 
So tonight, with that very broad introduction, I'm going to spend the next four sermons after this one on the character and the roles of men and women, younger and older. Now, I'm doing this because the Holy Spirit did this here in Titus chapter 2, verses 2-6. to six. I'm doing it because I want to speak from God's word of the wisdom which has been lost to one, if not several generations of young men and women. So let's begin with the background to this subject of the portrait of true humanity. I want to remind everyone tonight of why this thing has happened, of what kind of social changes that have taken place to leave our young people and our young men in particular in such a hopelessly confused and ignorant state that it can actually lose the will to live. The short answer to this um, though it is not all of it, is the socio-political socio philosophy known as Marxism. As I have addressed this in the past, I will make mention of only a few of the lowlights of the impact of this wretched ideology. It is fundamentally, aggressively, and actively anti-religion and anti-Christian in particular. It is also anti-family, and anti-marriage especially. It is anti-motherhood and anti-fatherhood. It promotes deliberately sexual promiscuity and vigorously advocates abortion. It is aggressively feminist, which itself is anti-masculine. And their problem we shall that problem we shall address tonight. It is anti-ethical in the sense that it defines truth the way that Vladimir Lenin, one of its early leaders, did, as, quote, whatever is good for the party. It deliberately promotes and fuels conflicts between groups of society and inspires and, if not, encourages hatred and lawlessness. In truth, it is such a pernicious influence on human society that it is little wonder that the persecuted missionary, the Reverend Richard Wormbrand, once penned a book called Was Karl Marx a Satanist? In terms of its socio-economic impact upon the world, as Dr. Peterson would point out as a non-Christian, that there is a body count of approximately 100 million murdered victims of its tyranny in various forms and of countless destroyed economies with all the misery that goes with it. Given that this pernicious ideology is dominant in the university of the world, and especially in the West, it is little wonder that women come out of the universities hating masculinity, that many men come out of them with their esteem shattered, their role in society confused if not unknown, and their lives prone to spiralling into all kinds of manifestations of destruction and self-destruction. I know young men who were subject to this kind of poisonous, vicious propagandising of Western culture and life. They were radically, sorry, they were racially abused because they were white in a white university in Australia. They were gender abused because they were male. They were sexually abused because they were heterosexual. And they were religiously abused, all of this in lectures, because they were Christian. <clears throat> Little wonder, as Dr. Peterson pointed out, that men are abandoning the humanities studies in universities in droves. Not that Marxism is poisoning most of the departments of unity universities the world over. But where do they go? Where do men go who are now outcasts even to themselves? Who are completely lost in their own culture and even among their own peers? Well, that is why so suicide is such an attractive opposition, option for so many of them. That's where they go. Before I look at these four groups of humanity within Christian society, I thought that I should give that kind of an overview of what's behind all of this and arising from that what it is in contrast to a Marxist view, what it is to be biblically human from a fundamentally biblical perspective. I cannot really leave that 
brief su summary of despair that has engulfed our young men and perhaps some of our young women too without taking back uh, and talking about the foundational statement about what we are and who we are and wh what we do and why we do it. In our present secular society, little thought is given to a worldview which encapsulates all of that and which inevitably answers all of these questions of personal identity and purpose and her role in human community. But I want to base everything I say tonight in terms of a portrait of true humanity on Genesis 1, 26 to 28, the so-called Dominion Charter from the Creation Week. So what I want to do briefly is under the heading of what we are, who we are, and why we are. So what are we? We are the image of God. One of the things that destroys human self-esteem uh, is the wrong self-perception within the created order. And there are essentially only two ways of looking at ourselves within that order. And that is either we are the highest form of evolved animal and therefore truly only ever an animal and the likeness of the animal or we are the image of our Creator, created in His likeness and called to reflect it and destined to regain it in all its fullness. These are the choices and they are very, very stark. So let me quote the Marxists at this point. Firstly, Vladimir Lenin said that humanity was that herd of apes that grasped sticks. Secondly, Marx, Karl Marx quotes Benjamin Franklin, saying, Franklin defined man as a tool-making animal. And thirdly, the, uh, the second of the fathers of communism with Marx, Frederick Engels said, man makes nature serve his ends. This is the final and essential distinction between man and other animals. So I have no need to tell you what this view of humanity has done for the world. Since it has become the predominant theory in anthropology, which is the study of humans. Whatever the proponent and defender of the theory of evolution claims, it has been used to justify some of the worst and most genocidal expressions of racism in history. It was the basis on which some non-white ethnic groups were regarded as inferior, if not subhuman, specifically the Australian Aborigines. Much could be said about this, but I'm here to speak to you of things that are befitting of sound doctrine, not just the things that sound, that, that sound doctrine saves in cultures and societies. I'm here to answer the question, what are we? And when it's answered in terms of the humanist, atheist and evolutionary doctrine, we are left as tool-making animals, no more, no less, or as some have said, mere naked apes. Now, in response to this incredibly degraded view of humanity, from the humanist and evolutionary point of view, what can we say from God's word about what we are? What is the sound doctrine that underpins our lives and identities as men and women of older and younger ages and stages in life? from Titus 2, 1 to 6. Well, there are numbers of sermons on this beautiful subject of the glory of humanity that could be written. But I only have here a half a point to say about it. But the text from Genesis 1, 26 to 28 tells us of the glorious truth that we are first and foremost a glorious reflection of the glory of God. Then God said in verse 26 of chapter 1 of Genesis, let us Make a man in our image and according to our likeness. What we are, every one of us, from the moment we are conceived, is the image and the likeness of God, our Creator. We do not belong to the animal kingdom. We are not mammals. Whatever biological, genetical, genetic and even behavioural similarities we share with other creatures, we are totally distinct and unique among all the creatures of creation. No other cre creature shares with us this thing called the image of God. And what is that image? 
The children's catechism tells us, question 10, how did God create man? God created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness and holiness, and with dominion over the creatures. So here is where our dignity and our uniqueness as men and women and as creatures in created, 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 creation's order is clear. We have knowledge, holiness and righteousness as God's expressed image. You and I, along with every single human being, are like him. We can know as he knows. We can be holy as he is holy. We can be righteous and do righteous as he is and he does, as animals cannot. We are capable of knowing God, of knowing each other, and knowing the created order. Indeed, as one author wrote concerning the German scientist and Christian, Johann Kepler, quote, observing celestial bodies left Kepler in awe of the stupendous miracles of God and caused him to praise God. Allegedly, Kepler once said that I was merely thinking God's thoughts after him. The definition of science. Concerning holiness, a Christian author whose name now escapes me noted that no one has ever observed a monkey building a church. Holiness in that sense is unique to us. That we look beyond ourselves and can worship is beyond the capacities of animals and plants. It is not a sign of the primitive but of the sophisticated. It is a sign of design and purpose, as the first catechism question tells us, in living to glorify God but also enjoying Him forever as no animal can. Righteousness thirdly reveals our capacity for good and for love, which in turn mimics the righteousness and the goodness of God, which is beautifully summed up, codified and defined in the law of God and crystallized in the love of God and man. Yes, we are capable evil, of evil. Yes, the best we do is tainted with sin, but nonetheless, these attributes in us survive. In even the worst of people, there are glimmers of the image of God that can still be seen and can be the basis of redemption. The beginning of our self-respect, of our dignity as a creature, lies in our, the likeness we have to our Creator, our glorious, perfect, majestic, admirable, and honourable Lord and God. Now, I'm not sure who said this, but it is surely true, that if an alien came from another universe, an alien that knew about God came to our universe and found us. They would recognise us immediately, the way someone recognises the child of a parent. We look like God in knowledge, holiness and righteousness. And that is a matter of great importance. And it is the basis, the foundation of true self-respect and of true mutual respect for one another. We can say no matter how small, weak, frail, obscure or humble we are, we are like God. We can say God is like me. I share in his attributes and he has left something of his glorious character and life within me. That is the sound doctrine of Christian anthropology or the doctrine of man. That is what we are as God's image. That is part of the basis of true self-respect and mutual respect, as I have said. So let's move on to who are we? And who we are, of course, in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, is we are the underlords of the planet. So in this question we raise, we address the issue of our place in the universe, the created order, and our place in relation to God. As men and women, we stand in relation to both the creator and the creation of which we are part, but a very special, unique, honoured and responsible part. The foundation of our manhood or womanhood is to be understood in terms of this relationship to God as he gives to himself and to his created order. And it's uh, Genesis 1.27 now. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created 
them. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The eighth psalm brings this out, this remarkable paradox of our humbled and yet exalted position as lords of the planet. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honour. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Did you know that modern Marxists, at least some of them, basically regard humans as vermin? They consider humanity to be an infestation of the planet, and a curse and a blight on it. They consider that we are far too many and that we need to be culled. A well-known royal personality in the foreword to a book called If I Were an Animal wrote in reflecting upon the destruction of animal habitats by human, by human population expansion. He said, I must confess that I am tempted to ask for reincarnation as a particularly deadly virus to reduce the Earth's population to 2,000. 2000 million. Well, Scripture at its very foundation portrays man and woman as the lords of creation. God gave them dominion over the world he created and privileged them with the management of the planet. In fact, I, Dr. Nigel Lee used to assert that that dominion charter, in fact, covered the whole universe and he cited the moon landings and space exploration as evidence that that glorious dominion extended to the moon, the stars and the sun. He reminded us, in fact, that the sun and the moon and the stars were our servants because they gave us our times and our seasons. Marxists see us as vermin. God sees us as stewards and stewards with a character and a dominion charter from God himself. So as part of that, our identity as lords of the planet, we also have authority. When we speak of dominion, we speak of the rule of law, not merely the maintenance of order and productivity of the created world of flora and fauna. That authority, that order was established beginning with marriage, found in Genesis 1, 26-28, with a wife subject to her husband, who is her head and her saviour, parallel to Christ and the church. From this flows the order of parental rule over children by both parents. Out of this dominion comes, um, sorry, out of this comes dominion within human society, the rule of law through appointed rulers. Out of the rule of law of ordered society, like the ordered family, uh, there comes a, a, an ability to be productive, to build wealth and to share that wealth. It is another glorious, God-given responsibility and privilege. Now we are honoured with this responsibility and in so ruling we again manifest a likeness to our God who is the Lord. That is our destiny and for this we know we shall stand accountable, especially for those who rule over others, all of them. As we grow from childhood into adulthood, this is what we grow into. If I may again quote the non-Christian psychologist Dr. Peterson, in regard to the advice he gives to those lost and troubled young men, he says that we ought to grow into the responsibilities of life because for the most part, the more responsibility humans bear, the better they tend to do under it, quote unquote. Yes, it has its stresses and its pressures, its sufferings as he acknowledges. And this is all part of the false consequences. But ultimately, we were created with the capacity to bear it as men and women in maturity. As he says, Dr. Peterson, we generally do well under it. We grow through it as people. Our societies grow through it. Our families, our workplaces are better for the exercise of responsibility. The whole creation needs us to do it and to do it under God's lordship with his wisdom and his spirit for our helpers. So that is what we are as the image of God. Who we are as the Lord of creation. Lords of creation, sorry. 
Let's spend the next part of this introduction to the ages of Christian men, men and women in looking at a little more at our role in terms of our work. And this has to do with why we are here. And a large part of it has to do with labour. This too, of course, is a great subject. I have already spoken to the issue of the Lordship of Creation and to the good order of that creation in our societies. Uh, and this comes to us again from verse Genesis chapter 1 and now verse 28. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the surface of the earth. So after the fall, God set out the division of labour in two very broad terms. Adam's primary labour would be in painfully eating of the bread of the sweat of his brow. He would till the ground and tend the flocks um, until other work became necessary as humanity moved from the agrarian life into the more advanced urban and technological life in the ancient cities of the pre-flood era. Eve's pain was also a labour. It was in the labour pains of pregnancy and birth. And so I want to consider these two things briefly in terms of why we exist under the Lordship of our God. First, in most cases throughout most of history, the labour of husband and wife followed broadly those two patterns of husband in the day working and wife rearing and bearing, bearing and rearing. Titus 1, 2 to 5 will confirm all of this. The Ten Commandments confirm, for example, at a most fundamental level, that work is a calling. It is a command from the fourth commandment. Remember in Exodus 20 verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work. Now, there are many commands to work throughout Scripture, but here it is set out in terms of the duration around the sabbatical principle and its law. The Sabbath, therefore, we should remember, is a law of work as much as is a law of rest. As part of the Dominion Charter, our daily labour um, takes its place in the midst of God's work of subduing the creation to His glory and for His pleasure. It is part of our motivation for what is called the Protestant work ethic. We work for His glory as the New Testament makes plain. All work under such circumstances is noble. In fact, as Luther said, all work is sweet. From Colossians, our reading in the New Testament, chapter 3, Paul wrote, Bond servants, or if you like, employees, Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as man pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the, the Lord Christ. Thus true work is not a kind of slavery. It is not a simple means to an end in pointless and endless self-indulgence, as it is for many. Whatever we do, no matter how humble it is, if it is done for God's glory and for the good of wider society, then it is noble, it is honourable, and it is pleasing to God. Now, it may not be exciting or even enjoyable at times, but as long as it serves others legitimately, it is good and it is pleasing to God. It is part of why we are here. And with this I should also add that childbirth for the modern majority of women is also a good and a noble thing. I would add it is a primary thing in a married woman's uh, life. The scriptures say, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Dr. Nigel Lee would say to wives and husbands this. One, be fruitful means have children. Two, multiply means Four or more, if you can safely and physically do so. Five, fill the earth means we all keep going until the earth has reached its full carrying capacity. So here again lies something of the glory of a man's life, that he should marry, 
to bear the responsibility for bringing into the world the world's children, who will join him and his wife in knowing and loving their Creator, worshipping, serving and obeying. If a man would want to have something to look back on when he is old, that he did, that was worth something, that did some good, it is to marry and to work with his wife, to bring children into this world and to do good through all of that. The best good he can do then is to have them live for God's glory and the good of his creation, especially for the needs of other human beings and their societies. But as Christian men, uh, but as Christian men and women, all of those most noble and helpful aspirations need to be placed under the Lordship of Christ to achieve their greatest good, which is the glory of God. So then in conclusion, the resolution of the identity crisis is the doctrine of man, anthropology, is not complete without the knowledge of God in the mix. Otherwise we are reduced to mere tool-making animals. But as the image bearers of God, we are instead tool-making image bearers of God. The ultimate dignity and purpose of any man or woman is captured in the title, Servant of the Lord. Here then is our message not only to younger men, but to other men and women who have been robbed of their true dignity and identity and purpose by Marxist feminist views. God created you to know and to love you. He gifted you uniquely with your gifts and your character to utilise for the benefit of everyone, including yourself, and to please and honour your Creator. He has put his seal on your value by giving Jesus Christ to clear your debt to himself through the forgiveness of all your offences against him and others. He has work for you to do uh, through which enormous good can be done, which you alone have been created and gifted to give. So return to your Creator by making him first your Saviour and then submitting to him as your Lord. There is no employer. No owner, no master who could give us our work greater dignity than God gives to us when we are reconciled to him and submit our lives in service in every way to his blessed calling. This is how we find our true nature, our true identity and our true purpose in the world. It is called Christian humanity and we owe it all to God in Christ who has given it to us. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do rejoice in the precious knowledge that we have, the sound of doctrine which has been revealed in the Scriptures in which the Apostle Paul urged Titus to be the basis of his instructions concerning the lives of men and women, old and young, in the verses that are to come in this second chapter of Titus. Take us from this, from this worship Help us to live our lives as you've called us to live us with the dignity and the wisdom and the grace that you alone can give. Help us too to be a guide to those that we come across in our lives, whether they are young or old, whether they are men or women who have lost their way, who don't know who they are or what they are or why they are here. Help us, we pray, to be a good witness, not only to Jesus Christ as Saviour, but also to you, our Creator, as Lord. And we ask this for their sake and for the sake of your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now uh, to God's praise from Rejoice 469. It's Go Labour On.
Let's bow for the benediction to conclude the service and we will sing after that the threefold. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.